Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Juliana Margulies and Lee Woodruff to our series. We invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is Live Talks LA. Juliana's book is Sunshine Girl, An Unexpected Life. She is an Emmy, Golden Globe, and Screen Actors Guild Award winner. She has achieved success in television, theater, and film. She starred on the long-running CBS show, The Good Wife, which she also produced and is also well-known for her role as one of the original cast members of ER. More recently, she appeared in The Morning Show, Billions, and The Hot Zone. Lee Woodruff is a writer and journalist. She is co-author of In an Instant, the compelling and humorous chronicle of her family's journey to recovery following her husband Bob's roadside bomb injury in Iraq. She has been a contributing reporter for CBS This Morning and Good Morning America. She is also author of Perfectly Imperfect, A Life in Progress, and the novel Those We Love Most. I am Ted Haptigaber, founder and producer of the series. Welcome to all of you. They will talk and towards the end, I will pose some questions that came from you in the audience. Take it from here, Lee. Thank you so much, Ted. And Juliana, this is an honor for so many reasons. Let's just start with Fangirl about you as an actress. The oh, thank you. The fact that we met and I interviewed you for your major role, um, The Good Wife, one yeah. of my favorite shows. Years ago, years and years and years, years ago. ago. And now here you are with this book that everyone out there needs to read because memoirs come in all shapes and sizes and this one fits everything for me. So let's talk about the book. Did you always want to be an author? Oh, no. Um, I mean, I wanted to be an author, but I never thought I could be an author. I should answer it that way because um, I have such respect for the written word and I love reading so much. And I never thought I would be able to express myself uh, on the page as well as I did in acting. So I'd never felt brave enough to write. <laughs> I took it in college. I took writing in college and I loved writing short stories. And my fa I come from, my father was a writer. So writing has always been a part of my journey, but never publicly. Actually talking about writing in your family, I, one of the things I heard about you before I'd ever met you was that your father created a famous jingle. And we just have to start with that. You have to do it. Yes, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief <laughs> it is. Um, is is my father's claim to fame. And it did a lot of great things for him in many ways, but he never felt that it was um, really his calling in life. He was very good at it, but he always wanted something a little deeper and more meaningful. I mean, we weren't even allowed to watch television as, as kids. So t television for him was not um, what he was aspiring to write for. You have such a great, growing up story and such a sort of eclectic, amazing story that we're going to get to in a second. But let's get back to the book for a minute and just just let it how and why now and what became the impetus for telling your story? It's a great question. Um, and I have to say it was a very um, it was not a thought out process when it started. I did not start out thinking, I'm going to write a book. I had been asked um, by a few publishing houses while I was on The Good Wife if I was interested in writing a book. And I just remember laughing and being like, and, and at, on what planet do I have time to write a book? <laughs> because I was spinning all plates at the same time. And um, But it definitely planted a seed in my brain of like, oh, maybe one day I will have the luxury of time to be able to sit down and write my thoughts. But it never felt like a reality to me. And then really what happened was this crazy seven year journey I took, which wasn't just about the good wife and that incredible show and that incredible journey that it was for me. Um, but it was about becoming a new mom and a wife and this new life that I had. And um, I finally, when, when the show came to an end and I got really sick, um, the, the day the show ended, I ended up, um, and I write about it in the preface because it was a great way for me to segue into my life story um, is that I got the chicken pox. I had adult chicken pox the second uh, the show ended. And I think that is a true sign that you are letting go of everything that you've been holding together for so long. Um, you know, it, 
it comes in all shapes and ways, but mine came in chicken box. And I ended up in bed for three weeks. And finally, with time to sort of ruminate on me instead of Alicia, I was always thinking, how does Alicia flirt? How would she handle this situation? How would, how would she do this? What are her lines? How did everything revolved around her and everyone else? Nothing really revolved around me. And in order to sort of shed my skin of a character I had become so uh, enamored by and also um, affected by, I needed to um, dig a little deeper. And in doing so, I ended up uh, writing this memoir, which has had so many iterations over the years it took me to write, um, which was wonderful and also frustrating because uh, the first nine chapters that I wrote that uh, Random House said, we want to publish this book. The second I handed in the nine chapters, I got, I was better after three weeks. And then I started working again as an actress, you know, and I would get jobs and I'd think, well, I don't have time now to write, you know, it was a fleeting moment. Um, and I really had to focus and I really had to separate my acting life from my writing life and how to, how to, how to divide the time up and how to make sure it would happen. And in fact, I actually, I, I tried to give back my advance um, three times because- you that's amazing. You got to talk about that, really. So you just felt like, how am I going to do all this? Yeah, I, I remember it was, um, I was on the hot zone and we were shooting in Toronto. And that was a very difficult, I've done a lot of difficult parts in, in, in memorizing dialogue. So medical dialogue is very difficult to memorize. Legal dialogue is very difficult to memorize. But scientific dialogue, when you're playing, uh, I was playing Dr. Nancy Jacks, dealing with Ebola, and the scientific dialogue and also having to train to learn how to how to be in a lab, it was excruciating and it took every minute of my time to learn these. Some, I, at one point I had a four page monologue and I remember I had a deadline for my first rough draft. And I am someone, if you read the book, you'll know, I like to be on time. I like to follow through with my promises and I was beside myself because I thought I'm going to fail everybody. I'm failing everybody and I can't do it. And I wrote an email to my editor, um, Pamela Cannon and my, my agent. And I said, I'm going to give back the, the advance. Thank you so much for your belief in me, but I can't hit that deadline and I'll never be able to with the job I have. And, um, you know, in, in five minutes, I got a very funny email back saying, great, what deadline would you like? <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm not going to get out of it that way. Um, and I just said, I don't know, this job is excruciating and I don't have time for anything but this job. And so then they just said, when you're ready, you know, get, let us know. There's no rush. And so then a pandemic happened. I had written, I had written the first two drafts of the book already. And then the pandemic happened and I could really zero in and just um, focus on that. And that was um, a, a, a strange blessing. That was the silver lining of the horrible pandemic for me. I find it so interesting when you were talking about inhabiting Alicia. And so as an actress, that sort of means you are thinking about the character I mentioned, especially one in such a, in such a regular show. So you're uh, you're shooting all the time. You read the book, and I look at your schedule, and I think, how was she even mothering? And I mean, you you talk about that, and you talk about the strain on that. But I think it's so. What's so interesting in what you just said is that because Alicia lives within you, or lived within you for all the years that you were shooting the show, Juliana must have been muted in a sense. And then for so for your story to rise out of you it almost took for the show to be finished with and to put that person away. What do you carry with you now still of that, Alicia? That's a great, a great question. And that's a, a really good way of putting it because it's true. I think I, I it wasn't that I completely um, forgot who I was as Juliana, but it was that the character sort of was more important than me at, at the time. Because if I was gonna have a spare minute to myself without being, you know, worrying about my child or my husband or getting food on the table, all that stuff. I was thinking, oh my God, I need to learn my dialogue for 
Monday because everything everything had a, was timed. Um, otherwise, I had no time, and so I really, I really put myself last. And um, I think when I got sick and was in bed and had this unbelievable luxury of time. Once I wasn't in pain anymore, you know, the chicken pox were painful for the first week. And then you have two weeks where you just look like a crazy person because you have scabs everywhere. Um, and I had to stay in. Once I had that time, um, I could start thinking about me. And in order to start thinking about me, I had to understand why Alicia had such a huge impact on me. Why that character that was written so beautifully by Robert and Michelle King why was it that she was always, always orbiting my inner thoughts? Because I've been acting a long time and I know being on a show and, and being the lead of a show and being there five days a week, 10 and a half months a year is a different, it's a, it's a different ball game than being a part of just um, an on, not just an ensemble, but being an ensemble player, you, you're not in it as much as, as I always was for that. So I was always thinking, even on my days off, um, what do I have to learn? What do I have to, uh, where do I have to get to in order to get that? And if I can get that, that means I can make dinner. You know, it was literally, it was like, I was just juggling everything all the time because I was trying to have the impossibility of this perfect life. And what struck me about Alicia and when I really sat back to think about why it, it really hit me hard that first scene I ever played of her walking down that corridor in the pilot and slapping her husband and then feeling this intense feeling of isolation, this intense moment of what now? Who am I now? That's really what she's saying when she's caught between the photographers trying to get um, a picture of her and this husband who just put her in this horrible position. She is saying, who am I now? And that's really what I was saying, Juliana, not Alicia. And so I had to peel back the layers of that. And in doing so, it allowed me back into this childhood that I had, I think, strangely laughed about, put on a pedestal. So many of my friends used to say, oh, you should write about your childhood. You had the most incredible childhood. I wish I didn't live in the same house all these years, you know, all my childhood. And my parents were, you know, ho-hum and they had ho-hum jobs and you were all over the world. And you, and I would look at them and go, yeah, I guess my mom's crazy. You know, that was just how it was. And then once I started really peeling back the layers and looking at my story and where I come from and how I've, how I've traversed the, the time to get to where I am now, it allowed me by writing to really pull it apart and put it back together. Does that make sense? It, it makes so much sense. And I'm kind of blown away with the fact that, you know, setting aside the Alicia part of it, because you had to keep growing as Alicia. As each season came, she changed. And that after that, there was this flowering of who am I now? And talk about that process, because to go back to childhood, there's pain, there's good, there's, you have these incredibly vivid memories. How did you exhume those? And yeah, that's a great question. And I, so I, I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I had for dinner last night. But because there was so much, um, I don't want to say trauma, because I was so loved and no one ever abused me or hurt me physically or verbally. I was a very loved child, but my situation was dramatic. I should say dr dramatic instead of traumatic. Well, but it caused a little trauma too. But the, you remember events in your life distinctly and clearly, more so than you'll remember an everyday experience. So because I had so much drama and adventure in my upbringing with my mother constantly and my father moving and deciding that I'm going to go here now and I'm going to go there now and we're going to live here and we're divorced, but you don't need your father near you and I'm going to you're going to live across the ocean and now you're going to come back across the ocean and now your father's going to go back. Every single, I remember the smell in the room. I remember 
what I was wearing. Uh, like things are so vivid for me because everything had this huge dramatic effect. Um, and I think if I had just stayed in Spring Valley in that house where I wanted to be, um, with my dad in the city and my mom in, in the suburbs and I could see my dad on weekend, if that had just been more of my life, I probably wouldn't have remembered every detail so, so well. But I also think because, and I, t I titled the book Sunshine Girl, An Unexpected Life, because Sunshine Girl was my nickname that my mother gave me uh, when I was born. Um, I, I didn't cry. I was a quiet baby. I always smiled. I, I made everything easy. Taking care of me was easy, she used to say. You were just so easy, my easy baby. Now that is um, a badge of, I wore that Sunshine Girl title like a badge of honor. However, upon reflection as an adult and seeing what I went through to get to where I am today, to have this unexpected life, I see how crippling it is to label your children because they end up needing to live up to that title and it might be true when you're three that you were just a cute, yummy, pudgy baby. But then when you're 25 and you're in a relationship that's not working, you don't, you know, you don't know how to leave because you want to be the one that makes everything, everyone happy and everyone okay and not ruffle the feathers or stir the mud. You know, you want, you're the fixer. And by, by being trained, I was trained for that through my childhood. And I talk about that in the book. Um, I didn't know how, how to navigate my way any other way as an adult until I got old enough to see it. And that was around 35. And talk about that moment, because that's a real inflection point in, in your book, is this moment of realizing, I don't have to keep tap dancing to make everybody happy. And some things are broken here. and. I'm going to have to be the fixer for myself. That, that's a really pivotal moment in your story. Yeah. And it was a frightening moment for me in my life to um, take the leap and to trust that, you know, not everybody's going to like you. People might get hurt. But who are you serving by leaving yourself out of every decision? <laughs> and that was... Um, it was a lightning bolt moment for me, really, when I realized, you know, my, I talk about my girlfriend, Nancy, in the book, um, who said to me, if you're happy 25% of the time and miserable 75% of the time, it's time to leave. If it were the other way around, it's time to fight for. And I think why that was a lightning bolt moment for me to change up my life was because I could see it in numbers rather than a feeling. When it, when it became just a number, it made sense. But my feelings were so, um, I was just so conditioned for my feelings to make sure that everybody felt that I was trying to make everybody happy and better, um, that numbers didn't run into, that, into my mind. Like I didn't even think that way. I only thought um, I'm, I'm going to grin and bear it because it'll be easier to grin and bear something than it would to change it. Um, and at 35, I woke up. I started saying, right, 25, 75, or is it 10, 80? Like, what's the percentage? <laughs> you know, I started, I started really, I also, I started to do a lot of self-reflection at that age because um, it's probably starting around 30, I, I, I began to take yoga. Um, pretty seriously. I, I sadly don't do it as much as I used to do anymore, but it got me into my breathing. And when you get into your breathing, your emotions come up. A lot of stuff comes up that you've been pressing down because you have to let it out. And when I really realized that I wasn't happy and could change it um, and change my narrative and not be the sunshine girl anymore. Like I'm an adult now. I'm actually in charge of my life. That little girl wasn't, and she was schlepped everywhere and torn away from her, what she knew and what felt good. 
And yet at the same time, I do see the benefits of my childhood. Honestly, I really do. I, I, because it, because I was never, um, I never felt unloved. Um, I see that it made me stronger. It made me adaptable to situations I don't think I normally would have been. And it also made me very curious. Um, and I think, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that part of it now that I'm not in it anymore. <laughs> but as an adult, to realize I can now change my narrative. My life doesn't have to be that. And that's why I talk about, I mean, the book is dedicated to my parents because, you know, they, they were my guides, right? That's who our parents are. Uh, that's who I am to my son. I'm his guide. I, I don't own him. I just can guide him with love. Um, but I don't own him. And my parents taught me that. And there's a lot about it that's great. I had to be self-sufficient. I had to know how to live this life I thought we were poor with my mother and this sort of know what fork to use when we went to a five-star restaurant with my father. I mean, I had this strange yin-yang experience. And I learned to navigate both both lives. And that Ultimately, when I really started looking into it, as I was writing, I realized, of course, I'm an actress. What on earth else could I have done? I was always putting on someone else's shoes, you know, and looking at behavior and how do I fit in? And OK, now I'm in America. I can wear my jeans and my sneakers and get my American accent back. And OK, now I'm in England and now I have to wear a skirt to school every day. And I'm going to speak with my, my English accent and I'm going to figure out what it means to be girl, more girly. Yeah, it was always just constantly navigating this road where I didn't fit in to the mold. And so acting made sense. Took my next question with that, because I was going to say how much of your life played into that, but you just answered that so beautifully. Were you not fitting in or were you a great chameleon at fitting in? And, and did you make peace with that at some point and when? Oh, did I make peace with it? Um, I think I always felt insecure. Uh, about whether I did fit in or not. Um, what I was good at, and you're absolutely right, I became a chameleon. I learned to change with every circumstance and situation. I wasn't secure enough as a child to just be who I was, this rough and tumble tomboy American kid who loved to ride horses. In England, the second I got um, dragged there again the second time I instead of saying I'm good just the way I am with my own American accent I I felt embarrassed to be different so yes I was I was a chameleon and I knew how to change and I learned it quickly and I would I would suss out a situation and learn to fit in and I was good at that but I never quite felt like I belonged it wasn't until probably my sophomore year in high school, in high school, I felt like, okay, I can, I, I don't have to be anyone else but who I am here with these people because I had been there for eighth and, and ninth grade. And then, and then I felt like I, I, we were staying. I didn't feel like I was going to get the rug pulled out from under me. Of course, my father ended up leaving America, but, but I didn't live with him. So it was okay. And I did feel like I, uh, my high school experience wasn't as traumatic in terms of me feeling like I belonged as my the rest of my life had been. Being a mom now, and you touched on this with your son, um, and you talked so beautifully about labels. Of course, I'm thinking back on all the nicknames I gave my kids as you're saying that. That's what, what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. We beat ourselves up. But what, I mean, there are, I read the book and I was one of those friends that thought, geez, like I had, you know, Buffy and Jody as parents, like, look at it, her life. Okay. There were moments that it was a little crazy, but what fun. And it made you this most independent. Uh, I saw you as an adoptable person. We bring our childhoods to our parenting. So what did you choose to bring? How are you parenting now from your childhood? And then we all have things about our mothers that we, realize like, oh my gosh, that was just drilled in me. I am my mother. Are yeah. there any of those for you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I spent so much of my life trying not to be like my mother because I didn't want to repeat the same mistakes she made in terms of her selfishness. I felt like she was selfish because her needs seemed more important than mine. 
at the same time, you know, and I, I wrote, there's a line I write in the book about this where my mother says, you know, all her friends who, who gave up their life for their children are chastised by their adult children saying, you know, mom, you should have worked and you should have had a life for yourself. And look, dad left you. And what did you do? You did nothing but take care of us, you know? And then of course there's me and my sisters who are like, mom, seriously, could you have once thought about me before you, you know, had that boyfriend or schlepped me to that country? Like, you know, so she always says, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in many ways. Here's what I took from my, both my parents, um, was that a child comes into this world who they are and your job really is to just guide them and that you they are not an extension of you even though that's how i feel most of the time i try to remember he's his own being and to look at him through eyes not just as his as the person who gave birth to him but as someone who can see him as a separate human being um, but what I don't want for him is to ever feel the insecurity of a family life, to ever feel embarrassed of my behavior, the way I felt about my mother so often in the eyes of my father. Um, and I write about that, how she put me in so many positions because I am a mama's girl and I have tremendous love for her. And I always did. Um, I could forgive her, her selfishness, but I could also, it pained me to see my father and my extended family, my aunts, uncles, grandparents have such disdain for her and for her choices. I, I always wanted to defend her and yet always wanted to agree with them. And it was just this horrible tug at my heart I, I couldn't bear it. And I, what I want for my own child. So Keith, Keith and I, my husband and I, when we found out we were going to have a baby, we both sat down and said, no matter what, we're always on the same page. Let's just always be on the same page. Be his support system. And I wanted boundaries as a kid. I was craving boundaries as a child. And I, um, I didn't have that. And we give that to our son. I mean, we're, we're, we're not horribly strict, but we have rules, you know? You can't do anything unless your homework's done. You can't, you know, we make the bed in the morning. We clear the table. We, you know, I want him to feel um, what I didn't, which is structure. Because I feel, I know for me, I work better uh, in an environment with structure that has structure to it, you know, even on a set. Um, I need that structure and, um, without it, you sort of fall apart a little bit, um, uh, or you, you choose two ways, right? I mean, I think because I didn't have it, I became too strict with myself, myself. I gave myself so many rules because that's my, I'm an A type personality. My son happens to be a B type personality. And both my husband and I are A types. And it is so interesting for us to learn to let go and let him be who he is and not put our stuff on him. Because he teaches me too so much. Um, and my mom taught me that. My mom always used to say to me, out of the mouths of babes, you've, you've taught me more than any teacher. And I hear her all the time and I say it to Kieran, I go, oh my God, I sound just like my mother. But it actually is a very respectful thing to say to your child. Um, he taught me a lot about the pandemic. I, I was really worried for him because he's an only child and the three of us were locked down in our house upstate and he's on a computer all day going to school. I mean, it just, I didn't, I was worried about him. And I said, are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? You can tell me anything if you're feeling anxiety or, and he said, mom, what's not to love? You and dad are home every night for dinner. You're cooking. I get to stay in my pajamas to go to school. He looked at it from a very different lens than I looked at it from because all of the structure I depend on was gone. And to see it from his point of view and to be able to understand that his point of view was just as important or if not more important than mine, to be honest with you, allowed me to just 
relax a little bit and not be so wound up that I wasn't doing a good enough job. So I take from them their love and their wisdom, but I don't take from them their practice, if that makes sense. A lot of sense. And I have so much respect that you can recognize that where where you end and he begins. And there sometimes those things get fuzzy and that's okay, but that you, I'm a type A too, and I have a couple type B kids. And it's just, I need to remember that's not how they, they'll get it done by the end of the day, but not on my time. And so- right. And, and to be able to walk away from that, because I always think I can do it better. You know, I'll be like, but honey, if you just, exa- I just have to step back and say, mm-hmm. let him do it for himself. You know, I talk about that in the book, like he couldn't tie his shoes when he was seven, because I was doing it for him because of the guilt I felt for working and, oh, this, I'll get it done faster. And, and then we can go out to the park or whatever, you know, and I was doing everything for him instead of making him struggle and part of the struggle is learning and yeah. Yeah. i sorry to interrupt you but i actually thought that was one of the most beautifully articulated parts of the book because what could be more boring than working mommy's guilt which i had my entire children's childhood but you wrote about it in such a personally searing way that i feel like you spoke for every one of us who missed had to miss the school field trip and you uh, you laid yourself out in this way that everybody could relate to. Let me. I'm so glad. Thank you for saying that because I hope. I hope. Uh, yeah, I think parenting is one of the hardest jobs any of us could ever do. It is the hardest job. I say that to everybody who ever stayed home with a child full time because you and I had the luxury of of doing other things too, but we still had all the guilt. Yeah. I want to get back to your mom because one of the things that's tricky about writing such an honest memoir like yours is how how is your family going to react? So your mother is such a central theme and for any daughter, it's a mom. How did that writing process work with her? Did you feel like you had to show her things, talk to her about things? That's always so delicate. Yeah, it's delicate. And I'll, I tell you, I um, I called her first and I, and I said to her, listen, I would like to write a book and I think you're going to be in it a lot. I don't know yet, but I feel like this is a a journey I need to write about. And she said, "Um, go for it, honey. You have the freedom to write whatever you need to write. I own my stuff. I own it. And she and I had been through a lot over the years. Um, I mean, the lucky, you know, the unlucky thing went as a child of her spiritual search for her her true self and dragging me and my sisters everywhere is that it was, it felt selfish at the time. But the beauty of that is that she's still at almost 86 searching still. So she's open. She's like this open wound. My mother, she just is there and she's still very out there and, and spiritual. And so she had worked on herself a lot over these many, many years. And when I heard her say, feel free to tell your story. It's your story. Then I would call her a lot because I needed some things I didn't remember. um, And I was wondering if she would remember. And then other chapters I wanted to read to her over the phone. Sometimes if I was upstate, she lives in the Berkshires and I'd drive up with my laptop and I'd read her to her on her her screen and porch. And she would howl with laughter or cry cry, um, uncontrollably. And she loved it. She gave me her blessing. And when she actually read the final copy and I sent her the book, I was actually on my way in the car to the airport to work for the first time during the pandemic. And she called and she said, I just finished the book. And first I wanna say, I love it. I love it. And second, I wanna say, I'm so sorry. Really? Whoa, what was that like for you? What, God, you're making me cry right now. I know, I just got too yeah. excited. Hang on a second. <laughs> no, and I don't mean to, oh, I hate crying. Um, wow, 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 wow. That's so, that says so much good about your mom. Yeah, and that's who she is, you know? She, listen, she's difficult to love because she is so eccentric and so, self-involved and I understand why she drove my dad nuts and I understand why my eldest sister had to move out of the house she is a tough nut to crack 
but in there is such beauty and and um deeply she's such a deeply feeling human being <laughs> that um she's almost too sensitive you know it's it's interesting with her she can be hot and cold and but to hear and i had heard over the years when i insisted on her apologizing to me for certain things that i felt were um worthy of an apology i.e putting me through living with her 21 year old boyfriend when i was 15. and i write about that in the book because um well there's many first of all it's a great story it's a great um, story. Think- <laughs> don't miss that one guys because that's one of the best i picture this groovy beautiful girl that's you and this kind of woke sexually open mom and i just think wow there were a lot of hormones going on in that house oh yeah exactly that's <laughs> That's exactly right. It wasn't pretty. Um, and that and that was also my own journey with my mom. You know, that was the, my first experience being an only child. Right. Because There's that no was my own road. I didn't have the security of my sisters to um, to talk to or to run to. So I was on my own. Um, but and I had I had insisted at the age of 23 that she apologized to me so we could move on because I didn't. I didn't want to have the anger. I feel like when you have anger, toward, especially towards your parents, um, and there was a lot at one point, it's so toxic and it's so hard to move on from there. And it's not my natural disposition and it doesn't fit right with me. I don't like feeling that way. So I have, Thank God, thank God I was able to confront my father, not until I was 40, but I did, and my mother, and I got a, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And it's, to be able to have a fresh, new relationship as an adult with your parents without that baggage, I don't carry that baggage. I don't, there's no one to blame anymore. There's, I'm done. Now it's my life and I have to navigate my own way. And it taught me so much um, about both of their openness to hear my complaint rather than to get defensive. Was that all it took? I mean, it it can be that simple, right? Just someone to release it. I think, you know, with my mom, when I confronted her the first time about the 21 year old boyfriend, she went into defense mode and we hung up on each other and didn't speak for a year. I actually had an entire chapter dedicated to that because it it ended up not working in the book, but um, it's amazing, isn't it? How many iterations happen? Oh my God. And how much gets cut and moved around and what was that process like for you? Because it's your life. I know it's agonizing. It's agonizing. And thank God I have to say, I, um, I had a really, I wanted an editor who wasn't going to blow smoke up my ass. Can I say that on here? I, um, that's not a swear that's word. That's a donkey, right? isn't it? Some <laughs> of it. <laughs> I wanted someone, um, I feel that way with directors. I, I want someone who's going to tell me like it is and not try to placate me or make me feel good about myself. That wasn't the, <laughs> that wasn't the outcome I wanted. I wanted someone to make this book great and help me make it great. And so when I was choosing editors, Pamela Cannon, I was immediately scared of her. She scared me. I mean, we laugh about it now. (laughs) Yeah. Scared me to death. And when I'd hand in a chapter and I'd get the notes back, I'd be like, oh, oh. And she'd be like, I really think you need to rewrite this and change this around. And And I'd have to walk away for two or three days because I'd be like, I don't want to change it. That's... And then I'd go back when my anger would subside or my fear and I'd read and I'd go, she's so right. Yep. That's why she's a professional. And that's why I'm not. (laughs) And I'd rewrite it. And so I knew when I'd get a chapter back from her, when she said it's there, I believed her, you know, but it took a lot of rewriting and it was painful. It was torture. Some of it was torture, honestly. Um, but I'm glad she, I'm glad she did it because I think it's a better book for it. Um, you know, it cuts off. She, she would say, do you need this? I mean, I had a whole chapter in there about so many chapters that ended up on the floor, but this one chapter was a period in my life when I had just graduated from college and was living in Brooklyn and woke up with the first time in my life 
what I sensed might be depression because I'd never felt that. I didn't, I couldn't understand people who said they were depressed. I was a, it's morning time. Let me make a cup of coffee kind of girl, you know, like coffee got me out of bed. I was so excited just to sip a cup of coffee. Like that was joy to me. And this one morning I woke up and it was like, I kept trying to swat my eyes, but the fog wouldn't lift. There was just this very heavy veil of fog and it, it rendered me immobile. Um, I stayed in bed all day and I wrote the chapter because I remember seeing it go to night outside my window and I still hadn't moved and my limbs felt too heavy. My heart hurt. I kept thinking, did someone die? And I'm not remembering what happened. Why can I not get out of this anxiety and depression I'm feeling? And I stayed there all day in bed. I didn't even realize I was crying until I felt, is that water on my face? Like I couldn't even move my hand to wipe my eyes. And when I woke up the next day, I tried to unwind in my head the feelings and why there was a pit in my stomach. And I realized I was very angry at my mother. All the emotion and anger I had put in a drawer for a rainy day for her because I was a teenager and newly in love and in high school and getting my driver's license. And I knew I shelved it for a rainy day. The anger I had towards my mother's um, incapacity to think of me first by bringing a 21 year old man I had never met into our home and making me share it with him. And it wasn't until I was 22 when I could address it. And so once I was able to call her and say, I need an apology. You and I can't have a normal conversation because I'm so angry at you for disregarding my feelings. I need an apology. And she got defensive as, as one would because, and we got in a huge fight and she hung up the phone. We didn't speak for a year and in her perfect dramatic Francesca way. She called me about a year later, give or take. And she said, I would rather die than not have you in my life. What do I have to do? And I had missed her. I had, but life was a bit simpler, not caring around the toxicity that that feeling gave me. Um, and we worked through it and she sobbed her eyes out. She said, I'm so embarrassed that I thought if I just didn't talk about it, it would go away. And I understand that, listen, we're all human, right? Children don't see their parents as human. And then when you get to be an adult and you can have it in your heart to open it up, to see them as just human beings also struggling. I mean, maybe my, maybe my mother shouldn't get a free pass on all of it because some of it was nuts. But it's also why I love her all these crazy parts of her and she is my mother and I don't have another mother, right? So I'm going to embrace it and choose to believe the I'm sorry and forgive me. But once I did that, I said to myself, and now that's over. You can't keep bringing that up in order to forge a, an adult relationship with your parents, because I think adults and adult children and parents have a trickier relationship actually than children and their parents when don't you agree i totally agree when you're a child there's a hierarchy yes and somehow you both become adults and you get a little judgmental at times yes absolutely sorry that was a very long-winded no answer. it wasn't it was fascinating because I, I think that the heart of the book and i and i should ask you what you think it is but for me it was your mother it was the magnetic push pull repel draw together of you and your mother. I mean, I, as one of three girls, I love the sister part and I have a, a sunshine girl in our family too. Um, but I just, I also was fascinated with you as the baby of the family. Um, I felt like you got a lot of latitude from your sisters, but also you were under this constraint of being, oh, she's the baby, she's the happy one, she's the easy one. And that put a lot on you. And you, you did talk about that. But when you think about the heart of the book. Like if you're in the elevator with somebody and they say, oh, you wrote a book, what's it about? What would your elevator pitch be on what's the heart of this story? What should someone take away from this? 
I do think the heart of the story is about changing your narrative. Um, the heart of this story is definitely the relationship between a mother and a daughter and a, and a father and a daughter. Um, but I think it's also about becoming an adult and letting go of your story so that you can navigate your adulthood in a different way than you navigated your childhood. There was a moment in the book, and I, and I might have missed this in real life, I remember it in the headlines, when you had an opportunity to re-sign for um, ER. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you walked away from a lot of money that, as you said, there was a line in the book, you know, could, it could, would have set you up for life. And you made a, a decision, I think, was it to do a play or an indie movie? Or you were just, can you explain that part of your life? And I had so much admiration for you and was so pissed at believing whatever the headlines were, like diva, you know, <laughs> what not good enough for her, whatever. I was like, I want that. The hook, line, and sinker, and this is the truth. Yeah, so I think everyone has to have their own, um, their own interpretation of what it means to turn down that kind of money. I think it hits people hard and it makes people feel, well, what would I do? And, and this is how my father actually really helped me get through it because I was so upset that people were um, so judgmental in, a, in not a good way at all. Um, and sort of thinking, who does she think she is um, to turn down $27 million? Um, and my father said to me, you know, honey, what you what you did when you did that is you're saying money isn't important. And for most people, that's the American dream is to be so rich you never have to work again. So you threw your decision in their face and they wouldn't have made your decision and that makes people angry and judgmental. And that was a really great thing for him to say to me. It was incredibly um, clear for me to understand that. And I, yeah, I was, the story is that before they had offered me that money to stay, my contract was going to be over. I knew I was leaving. And John Robin Bates had offered me this, he had sort of written this role for me in his next play that was going to be done at Lincoln Center with Jason Robards. I was over the moon. Um, sadly, Jason Robards passed away just before we started rehearsal, but I still did the play. Um, I was doing that. I had I had um, said yes to doing The Mists of Avalon to play Morgane Le Fay. Uli Adele, the director, had seen just a poster of me, I guess, and he, he, he said he could not stop seeing my face as Morgane Le Fay. He said, you were it. And to be on, I rode horses as a child. I, I grew up in England. It was all about having an English accent and being on the back of a horse and doing the, I, I grew up reading the, the Arthur legend, the King Arthur legend. So to me, um, and they were paying me very handsomely for that. You know, it was a TNT. I was the star. I, I had a, a year's worth of work lined up before they told me, if you stay for two more years, you'll make, we'll give you $27 million. So I had, I decided to explain that in the book, not really because I ever want to revisit this story because, but I do believe more so than not, it has defined me in the business and I need to own that. So I need to clear that up and, and let people hear my story. Um, and also hopefully inspire people to do what they feel in their heart is right um, and not not to allow the naysayers and the people who believe that having more money than God is the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, and I really did, you know, when my father said, you know, and what happens if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? And you, you said yes to the money and you said no to the play and no to the Miss of Avalon and all these experiences you were going to have. I was 32 at the time. I had, my mortgage was fully paid. I mean, I had no husband. I had no children. Like, wasn't I supposed to work really hard for six years so I could go off and make $230 a week at Lincoln Center and go off to Prague without worrying about a child? You know, wasn't this the time when I was supposed to be able to grab at all the dangling bits in front of me? That was that was the idea, was that I worked really hard for six years and I made great money and now I could go and explore what being an actress in, in another venue was. 
So that was what it was for me. And I, and I was hoping, you know, I actually had a great moment um, at the end of, uh, when I was doing the 10 unknowns is the play that I ended up doing for John Robin Bates at Lincoln center. And I was coming out of the stage door one night and there was a beautiful um, Chinese student and she was standing there and she was shaking a little bit. And this was still when all the hubbub about my turning down the money, you know, it still was lingering. And she had tears in her eyes and she came up to me and she said, I want to thank you your decision inspired me to do what I have always wanted to do, which is study medicine in the United States. My parents wanted me to take over the family business. And I think I may have broken their hearts, but when I saw that you went and did what your heart wanted, I did. And she, she, there she was in America, a medical student. She was gonna be a doctor. She's probably a huge doctor now, who knows? And I burst into tears and threw my arms around her and said, thank you. If, if, I, if I could inspire one person, I'm so grateful you told me. And that means the world to me. And it really did, I meant it. It was like, oh my God, not everyone thinks I'm crazy. And some people even followed me, how amazing. <laughs> so um, yeah. It was such a great message for a woman too, because I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like if a guy had made that decision, it would have been an artistic decision. And I, I felt that for you. I felt this sort of gender bias. And so for you to, if the theme here is you get to write your story your way, you're the narrator of your story. That was the moment where you decided you were gonna take the pen. And I just, I love that moment for you. And I think it sends a wonderful message to women, to moms, to daughters, to men as well, everywhere. This yeah, thank you for, you put that much more eloquently than I could. I think you're absolutely right. I think if it was a man, it would have been a very different story. Yeah, it would have been a hero story. Like, oh, look at him, you know, big Hollywood doesn't own Yeah, him. how creative. Yeah, how wonderful. <laughs> All yeah. right, before we go to our um, viewers and listeners questions, what's the question I didn't ask you that you wish I did? Oh gosh, um, what's the question you didn't ask me? Well, well I'll tell you. you I, yeah, what didn't you tell us? What do you want to tell us? I think, um, you know, there's there's a there's a few instances in the book that are sort of unbelievable, and one of them was the fact that my mother um, uh, bought a VW camper when I was uh, had just turned six and decided to uh, take me and my sisters and her boyfriend, who at the time, um, his name we called him Jesus Christ because that's what he looked like. He looked like Jesus. Um, but what was amazing, so so in this in the book, you can read this chapter. It's actually called Jesus in the Van, the easiest chapter I ever uh, had to title. Um, and but but one of the things that happened in that story, it's a crazy story, and and it's really when I started as a young child looking, observing body behavior because not only was it three little girls, Jesus Christ and my mother in a in a VW camper, but they also picked up two hitchhikers along the way driving down the coast of Spain, why not? Um, and uh, one of the hitchhikers had this, she had a twitch, but I just remember as a six-year-old watching her, her and wondering if she knew she had that twitch or what it felt like to have a twitch. And that was really the first time I started to observe body language. Um, and anyway, I had called my mom one morning to ask her more specifics about that trip and, and um, why she had kicked him out um, of the, the van when we got to Barcelona. Um, she kicked Jesus to the curb, I think I write. Um, but, but what was fascinating about that, and it's not in the book, <laughs> is that she told me, oh yeah, well, I'd only known him two months before we went on the trip. And I, I went, mom, three little girls? You took three little girls with a guy you had known for two months? <laughs> you're, you're insane. Who does that to children or to yourself for that matter, you know? And, to, and she said, you know, back then, honey, I mean, we are talking about the seventies, right? This was hippiedom, you know, probably 72, 73. It was like, that's what, you know, what you did, I guess. I don't know, but but to me, you know, she said back then, she never even thought about it. Now, when she thinks about it, she, she goes, oh, of course I would never do that now. But, um, those were the kinds of decisions I lived with 
that she made over and over again. And um, as an adult, I chose never, <laughs> never to do that to my child, <laughs> never make a rash decision like that. You know, maybe in a certain way has made me more, too conservative in the way I in the way I'm raising him because I, I want, I, I don't want him to only feel safe and held because I want him to be strong, but man, I wouldn't put my kid through that. I just love this story. I know we are out of time and I know a lot of people have some great questions to ask you, but this, you have brought so many things to light from the book and this is not a book to be missed to anyone out there. It's, it's not, and I said this to you when you sent me the galley, it's not easy to write a memoir that doesn't just go through something sort of chronologically, and this is my life. It would be so easy as a Hollywood star to just dash something off and take the check. And this is a, this is a book that has something in there for everybody. It speaks on so many different levels, and it is about writing your own story. It's about saying, this is what I came from. I've accepted it, embraced it. I see the crazy, I see the love, and this is who I'm going to be. Right. That's Thank you so know. much for saying that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it is not, um, it's not a book that's a, this is not, let me throw every famous person I know under a bus book. This isn't. You don't even call. give us your boyfriend's name. You're a celebrity boyfriend. I had to go Google it for heaven's sake. <laughs> no, because, because I, when I, and I'd love to just one, I know we have to go, but um, I write about my relationship with this um, actor that I had, but not not to throw him under the bus, but to show my own my own shortness of of capability and how to handle what I was doing. This was about me. It wasn't about him. Well, it and was that, all your twenty five seventy five, and and the twenty five seventy five doesn't really have to be about him. It's about, it's about where him. It was about my reaction to him, and I and I I wanted to show it that way. Yeah, you did. You did a beautiful because that the last thing I'll say. You know, we have to go is that the hard thing to do is protect those you love even though they've done difficult things you did a beautiful you put some bubble wrap around some people you loved in a really oh. elegant way but you still got the story out we still felt your you know angst and your your emotions so thank you so much get the book read the book and now i believe ted do we turn it back to you for questions yes uh we have a few questions um thank you lee First question uh, comes from a lady who says, uh, you know, celebrity and success can change someone. Uh, my question is, what did you do, if anything, deliberately when it occurred to you that you were a celebrity and headed to success? What did I do deliberately? Um, well, uh, I guess um, the only thing I can say is that I, um, I realized I could buy a house um, uh, celebrity and the celebrity part of my job is a little uncomfortable for me. Um, I don't like anyone treating me differently than they would treat someone who is waitressing at a restaurant. I was a waitress. And so I, I'm very, um, aware that there's a weird hierarchy and I'm not comfortable with it. So I really, I think the biggest um, thing I did to change my life was I finally was able to buy a home and and own a home. Um, but but that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, next question comes from a gentleman who says, um, working uh, on a stage production or towards a film or a movie is the build up to it is a much more collaborative effort uh, as compared to writing a book. I'm curious if there's anything from either of those you would take to the other, i.e. anything about how working on the book in a solitary fashion you think might help you working on a film or a TV show, or vice versa, anything from collaboratively working on a film or a TV show or stage production, did any of that help you in writing the book? Well, they're two very different beasts. Um... And yet I do feel, um, it's so interesting because when I first was meeting publishing houses with this nine chapters that I'd written, um, I remember one editor saying to me, so who will be your ghostwriter? And I was shocked, <laughs> you know, I was like, what? No, 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 this is my story. I, I'm the only one who can tell this story because it has to be in my voice. So I'm gonna write it. And I could tell that that worried them and I will tell you this, that having a great editor 
is a collaborator the same way having a great director when you're in a play is a is your collaborator and i need both um i saw it very very much uh in the writing process it's two very different beasts but in the end it's, it really is a team um yet yet i have to say i really loved um, the alone time I got to spend writing. There was something kind of magical to me because I'm always around so many people every day, which I love. I love um, being on a set, but walking into an office and shutting the door and saying for the next two hours, at least I'm sitting down by myself and I am going to write and having that alone time, it's quite cathartic in a very different way than being on a, being on a set. Um, but I love them both and uh, and I'm glad I have great collaborators, I have to say. There were several questions um, about George Clooney. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll just pick one of them. It says, uh, please ask Juliana what it was like meeting George Clooney on the set for the very first time. Um, it was great. <laughs> uh, you know, George was the, George, I think, the reason why I was so drawn to him is he sees life very much the way I do. He struggled for a long time before he made it. And to him, it doesn't matter if you're the best boy or the boom operator, or in my case, when I first met him, I was probably number 39 on the call sheet because I was just a guest star on a pilot who died at the end. And he treated everyone with respect. It didn't matter who you were on the call sheet. And um, I immediately was drawn to that. I thought that was so um, elegant of him and something I would have done. So um, that was my first impression of him was that he had a big heart. Um, what was uh, the ER reunion like? Fabulous. I actually, I, I, I just uh, wrote an email to Gloria thanking her, Gloria Rubin, who put the whole thing together. Um, it just really was wonderful to see everybody and, and heartwarming and that we were all so excited to see each other made it even better. Um, I, I was buzzing days after it. Uh, we were all texting and emailing each other how lovely it was to see each other. And that's a testament to a great show. I wish I wish everyone who had been on the show could have joined. And I'm I'm sad Eric and Sherry weren't there, and, but and Paul and Maura, but not everyone could be there, and that's okay. We're going to do it again. I think we have to because it was too good. Uh, two more questions. One is, do you have any regrets? Um, that's a great question, and I really try to live my life without them. Um, and off the top of my head, I can actually really say, I don't, I, I don't, I, I, um, you know, the subtitle of my book is an unexpected life. And it's because I never imagined that this would be the life I get to live. And I know I worked hard for it and I worked through a lot of stuff to get there. Um, when you work through things, I am so grateful that I worked everything out with my father before he suddenly passed away. And I, I would recommend everyone do that because when my father died, I knew he and I were solid together. He died with only love, no regrets. And I would say to anybody who has any kind of issues with their family or friends, work through them. Um, you'll never regret it. You know? Final question is, uh, um, a lot of artists take on activist roles in the public space. Uh, a, how do you feel about that? And if it's a role or a, a position an actor you admire takes that maybe you disagree with, can you separate the artist from the art? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And, um, I I think actors are given a platform, especially now with with social media and the internet and, and the accessibility to it. Um, and I really understand actors who don't take any stand 
because they want you to believe their character. And I, I'm on, sometimes I feel very strongly about, about that. Like, well, if I'm out here preaching this, are they going to believe me as, you know, Laura Peterson, who I'm playing on the morning show? But then there are moments where I realize I can shine a light on things that normally wouldn't have a light on them. And one of the biggest things for me has been Aaron's Law, which um, is a one-year mandate. Aaron Marin, who who was um, sexually abused as a little girl from the age of six to 13, um, finally spoke out when she realized her little sister was being abused by the same cousin. And she has been um, running around this country. We have 37 states passed, by the way, with Aaron's Law. And all it is, um, is a one hour mandate in every school to teach children what safe touch is, what is an age appropriate. It's a phenomenal law. And when I met Erin, I thought, how can I help her? Because we should all be protecting our children. And all I can say is, um, I never feel that someone is watching me act and thinking, oh, she's the girl from Aaron's Law. <laughs> it's never really happened that way. And I feel like the spotlight I can shine and help Aaron to get these laws passed, which just, just two weeks ago, actually not even a week ago, nine children came forward. We finally got the law passed in New York State. Nine children after a one hour class came forward and told their teacher that the principal of the school had been abusing them for years. And he is now in jail. And that was in Rochester, New York. And it happened because of Aaron's law. So this is working. We're protecting our children. And I feel like children don't have much of a voice in the world. And so I want to give them a voice. And I, so I felt very passionate about that. Um, I also feel very passionate about um, a lot of things. And when I feel it's right, I will jump in. And when I feel I can help, I will. Um, but I understand the question. And I think it can be a slippery slope. Uh, I get it. But I... I try to help where I can, and I try not to spread myself out too thin so that I'm not really helping anywhere. Well, thank you very much, Juliana. Thank you for sharing your book and your story. Thank you to Lee for asking terrific questions. Again, Juliana's book is Sunshine Girl, An Unexpected Life. It is available wherever books are sold, and a limited number of signed copies can be purchased in the link below. Thanks, and go on gently.